So today we're going to begin our introduction of concepts for CSC 235, the ACS Virtual Technology Lab. And uh, basically uh, we're going to, we're going to post a draft of a study guide so we're going to have four modules and we're going to post the draft of a study guide. And uh, basically, remember that uh, whenever you're dealing with uh, anything that's listed in the study guide, you want to make sure Can everybody see that? So anything that is listed in the study guide, you're going to want to make sure you know well, you're going to memorize it. And uh, anything that's in the resources folder, references folder. So when you go into your module, if it's in the references folder, like the study guide, you're going to memorize the reference. Okay. If it's in the resources folder, you can watch it and, and become familiar with it. So this is know it cold, uh, watch it and become familiar with it. Any questions about the distinctions of importance between the study guide and references versus resources? Any questions? No. Okay, so the student learning objectives are gonna be listed in the study guide and you'll notice here that we'll read through them. We want you to be able to relate the primary components of all computing systems from the von Neumann model. So this is something, this is a piece of uh, knowledge. This is a component of knowledge from our computer architecture course. And, but the von Neumann model is introduced later. In this course, it's helpful to look at that model sooner instead of later. Okay. Uh, we're going to describe the basic function of each hardware component common to all digital systems. Right. We're going to explain how components are refer referenced by number as an industry practice. So each one of these student learning objectives, you're going to want to read this, right? So virtual networks, you want to talk about the industry trend, how hardware advances have exploded, right? We want you to be able to define terms like virtualization, hypervisor, open source, commercial, etc. So I'm, I'm drafting this now. I'm, I'm drafting this based on your textbook. What do I mean by that? This is the Kindle app. I downloaded it from the Amazon website. When you order the Amazon app, let's go here. If you go to Amazon, once you order the app, I mean, once you order the book, the electronic Kindle book, you can put in Kindle for the PC and it's a download. And if you're running Windows 10, you're gonna pick this one. So when you click on this, it's gonna put it in your cart. It's actually gonna put an item in your cart. You have to sign in. There's no cost associated with the Kindle reader. The Kindle reader is free. But what happens is that after you sign in and you, you uh, authenticate your account with Amazon, it's, it's gonna be in your cart and then you can go ahead with your orders. So it's gonna order your stuff. And I'm gonna go ahead and log in with my account so you see what I'm talking about, okay? So I have, a, I have an Amazon account on my domain, I call Holy City Cyber. I 
I have two-factor authentication, so I get that. I gotta tap the link and the notice and let me through. Okay. It's going to show this in your cart. It says Kindle for PC download. At one point, you're going to see a screen that shows download, 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 PC download. And you're going to click a button and it's going to download the app. And so I have the $9. <clears throat> $9 textbook. This is the cover. Virtual Box Made Easy. <clears throat> and the content for our first module that goes in our first study guide and the activities for our first solution, setup of your first virtual machine, covers chapters one through three. It's 30 pages, but there's a lot of pictures and such. So if we go ahead and take a look at this, right, it explains virtualization and virtualization benefits. And that's what some of our, oops, that's what some of our, some of our objectives are, right? You have to summarize how sharing the physical hardware allows for resilient virtual systems. That's one of the benefits, right? There's greater resilience. You have to explain the five benefits from virtualization and the one caveat businesses should consider. So those are the things that you'll find here in these chapters. What is virtualization? It's explained and the benefits. Then there's a content involved with installing VirtualBox. It talks about what you do for system requirements on your host machine. Host machine is your personal technology. If you've been preparing your personal technology for use with VirtualBox, that's one of the things you have to do. That's not in the textbook. It's required and it's something I've added. It tells you how to install it, then you install it. You also, you also load the VirtualBox extension pack and then you work with the interface to make some changes. In simple terms, <coughs> basically virtualizing computers and networks. All right, so if you double click on a word, it defines the word. Another reason for having the Kindle app is if you come across a word that's complicated, it can, and you're connected to the internet, if you double click on it, it can look up the word virtualized to convert to a computer generated simulation of what the real hardware is, right? So kind of helps you work through the textbook. Um, one of the things we want you to understand is how important this concept of virtualization is. So the textbook tells you about Oracle, the company that uh, offers VirtualBox free to the public. And it also talks about other kinds of virtualization software. And uh, basically what's happening is that you're creating um, a representation of the computer processor or CPU a representation of the memory, a representation of the hard disk or storage. It's a, it's a representation of those things in memory. That's the virtual aspect of it. So it's not physical, it's not physical hardware, but it is based on the physical hardware. One of the important things to understand is that if you don't have it, you can't use it. But what do I mean by that? I have a laptop with 12 gigabytes of RAM. Can I create a virtual machine with 32 gigabytes of RAM? What do you think? No, you can't. No, you can't. That's the correct answer. 
So you can't you can't loan or you can't extend what you, you can't you can't loan out to someone what you don't have. Right? You can't use what you don't have. Can you create can you create a virtual machine with a terabyte of disk storage when you only have a laptop hard disk with 300 gigabytes? What do you think? No. No, you can't, right? So one of the limitations or caveats of, one of the limitations or caveats of virtualization is that the physical hardware will limit you. Whatever you're creating in terms of virtual systems, if you don't have it in physical hardware, you can't, you can't create it as a virtual machine uh, if, if, you're, if you're doing more. Let's say that I have a CPU that has two cores. It has two mini processors or hyper-threaded cores. So a CPU has so many different components and the CPU basically uh, has two cores. Can you create a virtual machine that uses eight CPUs? What do you think? Um, Robert, what do you think? Oh, um, Dr. Kentop, I missed something, so, some of your, um, what you're saying because of the, the, um, connection. Okay. Yeah. So it kind of glitchy. All right. I just said if your, if your processor, if your CPU chip on the laptop has two processor cores, can you create a virtual machine with eight cores? No. No, you can't, right? Now, one of the things that we want you to understand, all right, so let's talk about the von Neumann model. When we talk about uh, what's present in each machine, this works for both virtual and physical systems. So every, every digital device, every, every personal technology, all the personal technology that's designed, any computer systems, servers, network equipment, all of that, it's all based on this model that was devised by John von Neumann a number of years ago. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit Basically, every computer has a CPU or a central processing unit. And inside that central processing unit, there's something that does the math or data processing. It's called the arithmetic logic unit, ALU. And there are very small memory registers to store. So what happens is that uh, while the calculations and computing statements are playing out, there's a temporary storage right there next to the arithmetic logic unit, but it's very small and very fast. There's also something called a controller. It controls which statement runs next, which tasks are performed in which order, and that's what's in a, in a central processing unit or computer chip. Uh, all computer systems also have random access memory the important understanding about random access is that the CPU can access randomly what it needs. And that's important because if a CPU could only access in order based on the memory addresses, uh, it, it couldn't juggle tasks, it couldn't switch uh, on demand. So the whole idea of random access memory or RAM there are two types of digital information that are stored in memory or RAM. Data is just general characters, letters and numbers, and then you have instructions. So the two types of digital information that are stored in memory are raw digital information and the instructions that operate on that data. You have data and you have 
programming statements that process the data, that operate on the data. There's also, in every computing system, there's input and output. And a hard disk is an example of both. So one of the distinctions I want to call out to you is that there's a two-way arrow to and from the memory on the CPU. And then the input and output devices, like your hard disk, your keyboard, your mouse, your video screen, your sound card, your network card, those are all input-output devices. And those stand apart from uh, memory and uh, CPU. And what often happens is that when you have input coming in from the keyboard, the CPU has to determine, OK, what am I going to do with this keystroke? And it stores it in the memory. That's why the CPU is in the middle. So the CPU helps process what happens with input and output. I want you also to notice that the arrows, the direction, are distinctly different than here, where memory flows, data flows back and forth between memory and the CPU freely. Here, it doesn't. Some devices are only input, like keyboards and mice. Others are only output, like video displays and screens and sound cards, right? A microphone is only input. A sound card is only output. Other devices, wireless devices, wireless cards, Bluetooth, uh, a network interface, that's input output. It does both. but there are different pieces of hardware that handle all the input and different pieces of hardware that handle all the output. What it's easiest to think of the, the model of a computer in three zones, right? You have the, I want you to think of it in three zones. You have the active memory, you have the process of data, and you have the flow of inputs and outputs. One other thing that's important to understand about the model for a computer and this was John von Neumann, a pioneer that came up with this 50 years ago, right? Long time ago. Still being used today. The thing that's important to understand about this model is that it works for physical or virtual systems, right? And it hasn't changed. I mean, you have to understand these three pieces. And there's another way of looking at the way a computer works in terms of this raw information. I want you to think of an analogy. When you, when you think about the model of, um, when you think about any computer that's operating, I want you to think of it like a computer as a workshop, a wood workshop, okay? Everybody with me? We're gonna use an analogy to help remember how each of these different pieces work, okay? So let's pretend that the computer is like a woodworking shop, all right? I want you to think of the input and output side of this to be like the storage bins. In a workshop, you have storage bins, okay? And so you have wood that's stored on shelves and, and in bins. You have tools that are in shelves and in bins, right? So long-term storage is your input and output, your hard disk, okay? In the workshop, the memory represents your workbench, the space that you have to do a project. You might have enough materials on the shelves and in the bins to do 57 projects, but your workbench is only going to be able to accommodate two or three projects at the most. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand? Your workbench in the workshop is going to be the active space where existing projects are being worked on. Okay, you might have future projects that you work on with materials and resources and tools that are on the shelves and in the bins, that's your hard disk. Your RAM memory is like the workbench, okay? So your RAM memory is like the workbench in the wood shop and you can only do two or three projects at a time and, and then your workbench is covered. It, your workbench is completely covered with tools and materials and you don't even have room to go anywhere else with it. Does that make sense? 
Hello? Yes. 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 Okay. Now let's look at the CPU. How does this memory in the register differ from the memory out here? I want you to think of the workman, the wood shop worker. If you're using a tool and you're using materials, I want you to think of the hands and clamps that are used for that woodworking to be the to be the mechanism that holds that material and works with that material. Think of the hands of the woodworker as a space that the minds and muscles of the woodworker can work with. There's much more space on the workbench, but the woodworker can only handle, literally handle with two hands only two objects, hold material or hold a tool or use both hands to hold a tool or use both hands to hold a material while somebody else does. So there's memory that's right next to the arithmetic logic unit that does the data processing. It processes the instructions, but it's like you have to have a little bit of workspace that you can manipulate on a very on a very granular level, on a very low level, right? So I want you to think of the bins and files being the hard disk, the workbench being the RAM or memory, and the hands of the woodworker to be the registers that handle smaller amounts of material and smaller amounts of tools, right? You can have lots of project resources and materials and all the tools that you need for a given project but ultimately you can only pick up one tool at a time and you can only pick up one board at a time and you have to have hands. You have to be able to put something, hold it in your hand. If you, if you can't, if you can't put it in your hand, you can't work on it, right? If you can't put it in the register, you can't work on it. So we have a space issue. You have the furthest space away. That's the most space you have working space. That's local and then you have your own personal space. That's an analogy I want you to think of when you're looking at the model for a basic computer system, whether it's a server in a data center, or, you know, it could be as big as uh, the mainframe, you know, the main systems that uh, Google and Microsoft and Amazon use, or it could be as simple as what you hold in your hand with your smartphone. There are three zones, RAM, CPU, and disk space input output, right? Those are the three zones, the flow of input and output to a permanent storage disk, the active memory on the workbench, and where the action actually happens, where the work is actually done inside the CPU. Okay, um, I hope that helps, but I want you to memorize, I'm gonna give you a blank one and I need you to fill in these labels, okay? So when I tell you that you need to know the von Neumann model for computing, I want you to know each of these three zones. The input and output are on the right and there, there's a single arrow going in and out. That's your clue that this is input and that's output. This one has three components inside the CPU. That's your clue that there's an arithmetic logic unit, a register and a control. And the memory here, you have raw information and you have the programming instructions that operate on the raw information. Okay. We good? Yes. Okay. So let's go back to this. They're talking about, uh, so the, if you know that much from the study guide and you go back to the book, this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to give you a picture figure 1.1, and I want you to be able to label the main components of a virtualization application, the main components of a virtual solution, right? When we talk about the host, we're talking about the physical hardware, the physical PC. I want you to think of this as a game console or a PC or a laptop or a smartphone or a server or a network switch. It's the physical host. So whenever you see host, we're talking about the server that it runs on. This host can often be called a server, okay? 
in order for virtualization to work, there's a piece of software called the hypervisor. It, it has to do with the virtualization, and that's a weird name. But we're taking the physical and we're making it virtual, and it uses this hypervisor to share those hardware resources. So the function of a hypervisor is to share resources. So from the graphic, you see the physical server is called the host on the bottom. Sometimes it's called, sometimes it's called a server. The hypervisor is the application, the virtualization application, the virtual box. Okay, virtual box. Virtual box is running on top of the hardware. And then the guest virtual machines are running inside that application. So we have a physical host and then we have virtual guests. Inside the virtual guest, you have a CPU, you have RAM, you have hard disks, you have keyboards, you have USBs, you have CDs and DVDs, you have display adapters, graphics controllers, network cards. Each one of these is using or sharing the physical CPU, the physical network card. If you don't have a network card on the host, how many network cards can the guests have? Let's repeat the question. Gentlemen, if the physical host does not have a network card, how many network cards can you share with your virtual machines? None. None. You can't create the virtual representation of a network card if you don't have one. Okay. I know I keep coming back to that, but on your first assessment, we're going to ask you to fill out these and label these, right? You want to know host, guest, and hypervisor, what's in between. This layer in between is called the hypervisor. Those are the three main components of a virtual virtualization, right? A virtual application. Any questions? Are you going to be able to fill this in? Are you going to be able to fill that in, right? Okay. It's so the textbook talks about how this is shared. You have a shared resource. So the actual physical hard disk, the actual physical memory, RAM, the actual physical CPU, it's shared and what it creates is a layer of virtual disks, a layer of CPUs and a layer of RAM. And then that becomes this virtualization layer. And on top of that, you can have a virtual PC, a virtual laptop, a virtual server, a virtual uh, network switch. You can have a virtual, all this stuff, virtual smartphones, virtual wireless, um, wireless routers. So the wireless router you have in your house, you can create a virtual version of that here. And it's sharing the virtual processor from the physical down below. That's what this graphic is designed to show. Just remember that the hardware is shared. Now, why would that be an advantage, right? And why would, why would that matter? Um, let me show you this. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. Right now I have a laptop that has a lot of applications going, right? And this is a $400 laptop that I bought used so I have a CPU that's only used 23 to 25%. I have RAM memory that's only used, I've got 12 gigabytes free. I'm only using four gigabytes. So I'm only using a third of the memory. I have disk space. The reason that we virtualize is because if, if businesses have a server, a physical server, if they do it the old school way, it's going to cost a lot of money. 
Uh, so here's another here's another representation of right here's your physical host, your virtual box, and then these are the virtual machines running in there. So why do we do this? A physical server can cost up to ten thousand dollars. Okay, the actual box. When I say the actual box, I'm talking about this server box. So if a business buys a ten thousand dollars server, but they need an email server and they need a file server and they need um, a web server. They're buying all of this hardware. They're buying a hardware for, uh, version of the server for the website. They're buying a hardware version of the server for their email. They're buying a hardware version of the server for their files and printing, right? And what we found out is that uh, computer hardware has advanced so rapidly uh, another gentleman who worked with von Neumann, his name was John Moore, came up with this idea that every 18 months, the performance of computer hardware doubles. So after 25 years, if you have, if you have a $10,000 hardware server, that $10,000 hardware server now, 25 years later, it, it doubled in capacity and performance every 18 months for the last 25 years. I have a machine that I've paid $10,000 for, but I can actually run 12 servers on it. So instead of requiring, instead of requiring 12 physical servers for $10,000 each, right? I, I can now buy one $10,000 server, run 12 servers on it, and instead of having 12 times 10, I'm just buying the one server and then I'm buying the different versions. Now, the one, the one caveat is that if you're sharing all of those resources, you probably want a second physical server. You want at least two servers, if a business, we're talking about business virtualization. So if you're using virtualization in a business, you wouldn't want to put all of your servers on just one physical machine. You could still buy the $10,000 server. But if you buy the $10,000 server and you have 12 servers running on it, email and web and you have a VPN server and you have uh, all sorts of a database server, right? You have all this stuff that you need for your business, right? Um, helps you process payments at point of sale and all this. You have all these different servers. If that one physical machine breaks down, then nobody has any systems to use. So what the, what the author of your textbook is saying is that even though, even though you can save a lot, right? Cost savings is one of the virtualization benefits you probably want a second physical server. So now you're gonna buy two of them, $10,000 each. And because you have two of them, now if one of them has to be shut off, if one of them requires maintenance, if one of them has to have an upgrade, uh, the other virtual machines can keep on running. What am I saying? You can have a running virtual machine and before you turn it off, you can move it to another physical machine. So you can have redundancy, which means that you're, you have more stability. So you're saving money. And if you need to move a machine to a better physical machine. So if you have, if you find out that some of your virtual systems are taking up too many resources. Let's say everybody's doing email and web and those two virtual servers are running slow. You can buy a new, better physical server for email and web. Then you can slide the email and web servers over onto the better physical server and they never stop running. They just keep right on running. You never have to power them off. We live in the Virgin Islands where there's lots of outages, right? How many times does your internet service go down? Hello? 
A lot. Not all the time. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, too often, right? Now, yeah. if they did this, if they did this and they had to power a physical machine off and they had this virtual setup, we'd never be down. Your internet would always be working. It would never stop. That's one of the advantages of doing this, right? I'm thinking one of you guys is going to get a decent job helping businesses in our territory do this. So even when the power goes out or internet drops, they keep right on working. That's because you have more than one system and you can keep moving the machines between the systems whenever you have to power down the physical ones. So that's another advantage. It's computer management, right? If you, if you, have, if you need more performance, you can just buy a better physical server and then slide these things over onto it. And now it's like you got a, a brand new virtual server also. Experimentation is another advantage of virtualization. Another benefit, one of the five benefits of virtualization, which is one of our student learning objectives, right? You have to learn each of the five benefits of virtualization from the textbook. Experimentation. If you want to try some software, if you want to try something out, a lot of us like to experiment. You can try something on a virtual system, and if it ends up messing up the virtual server, all you have to do is delete it and start over. It doesn't affect the other machines that are running. So what am I saying? If you want to try something new, you can keep your web server and your email server and keep running those. And you still can test it on a new virtual system. And if it doesn't work out, you just blow it up and delete it and start all over again. That's much easier to do than paying for a whole new physical server. Hardware management, right? So let's say that, uh, let's say that you have eight gigs of RAM. Right? Hardware management is an advantage. If I'm running a virtual machine on this system, I'd, I'd call this advantage hardware utilization. I'm only using 20% of my CPU. I'm only using a third of my memory. I can, I can dedicate my extra CPU, my extra memory to a server that needs more of it. I can slide those around and just reassign more memory to the slow machine, okay? Or more CPU to the slow machine or more Wi-Fi bandwidth to the slow machine or more graphics controller to the gaming machine. So if you wanna virtualize gaming machines, you can do that and gain an advantage for certain games. Oh, we're gonna play this game. It has higher graphics. I'm gonna need more GPU. You can just slide it around. Hardware management or utilization. That's the third benefit. Backups. This is one of the biggest ones. Everybody knows what a backup is. It's an extra copy of the data or the software that you have running. But when you virtualize, you have this thing called a snapshot. It's a point in time backup. So if I take a snapshot of a running a running virtual machine. That snapshot is a copy of everything that's true and valid on that machine for that point in time. So what am I saying? Uh, I'm working on a report and I have most of it done and I take a snapshot. And then the next day my virtual machine blows up and it crashes. I tell the virtualization software hey, roll back to this snapshot. It rolls back to yesterday and my reports on the virtual machine. It's like it, it never disappeared. I can just roll it back. I can roll it forward, I can roll it back. And so backups are much more effective because you're not just backing up a piece of what you're using, you're backing up the entire computer itself and all the files that are on it. So backups are more efficient with snapshots when you're using virtualization. So those are some of the main benefits of virtualization. And we want you to be able to explain that and describe that. And we want you to know what that is, right? If we say, oh, well, uh, backups 
are uh, an advantage, most people would say, well, I already back up stuff. I have an external hard drive. I have a thumb drive. So what? You say, well, but does your whole entertainment system, let's say you had a small PC you decided to use for an entertainment system and connect it to your living room TV and you were using virtualization with that entertainment system. And let's say that uh, Netflix came up with a new version of their software, or let's say that um, the hardboard, the, the hardware manufacturer came up with new drivers for the sound card and the graphics controller and all that. If you had a snapshot, you basically roll it back to what you know is working. You can basically say, oh, I know it was working last week, roll it back to the snapshot last week. That's different than having a separate backup of your movies, but then you didn't back up, you didn't back up the drivers for the video. So you don't have the old drivers for the video. So you can't make the media center stream Netflix any better because it's, I mean, so you still have the, you still have the movies, you just can't play them because the drivers for the video controller are, are, are gone, right? Having a complete backup of everything in, in the form of a snapshot is different. It's more effective. It works most of the time as opposed to other backups that only work part of the time, right? So sometimes you can't work with technology because the data has fried. And sometimes you can't work with technology because the operating system changed or the, the controllers, the drivers for the video and the sound have changed. Oh, now I can watch the movie, but there's no sound because the sound card driver was updated. Oh, it sucks to be you. Oh, you. Yeah, your copy of the movie works. Now all you have to do is move it onto another system so you can watch it. Well, that's goofy. Who wants to work that way? I don't want to work that way. I don't want to have to transfer all my movies to another machine just to get it working. The whole point of virtualization is it's going to be a more effective way to restore and recover. That's a resilience issue. Are there any questions about the advantages of virtualization we've covered to this point? No. No. Okay, Robert, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Um, I got everything. Okay. Now, uh, we are going to install for our first solution. We're going to install VirtualBox. If you have been preparing your personal technology, your first solution will be to download VirtualBox and set it up, and then load your first virtual system. You're going to create your own virtual PC with hard drives and memory and virtual CPUs, virtual network cards, everything, right? It's going to be all built, pre-built. You're going to have a system running within your system. But what you have to do is know how to install the virtual box. And chapter two is about all that. It walks you through the process so you know. And uh, this information is also going to be in the study guide. One of the important things you have to understand are the system requirements. We just spent a lot of time saying, can you build a virtual machine with 32 gigs of RAM if your, if your laptop only has eight gigs of RAM, right? The answer is no. So depending on what kind of virtual systems you wanna run, you wanna make sure that your, your, your hardware requirements are matched for it. If you wanna run one virtual machine, if you have eight gigs of RAM, you can run one or two virtual machines very nicely. If you want to run a dozen virtual machines and have your own little virtual world, you'll need more like 32 gigs or 64 gigs. When you read the software, it says, oh, any kind of processor will do. But there's a virtualization component in the processor. There are some laptops that do not have the Intel VT or AMD-V virtualization support for the physical chip that's running on the laptop or PC. 
In a gaming console, this is turned on already. If you own an Xbox One gaming console, anybody here have an Xbox One? Anyone? No one? Yeah, I don't think anybody have one. No. no. Yeah, what, have what do you got? Playstations? Have a Nintendo Wii? What do you what do you got? Xbox. Xbox. Okay. Xbox runs virtualization and that virtualization support is already turned on. So it's already turned on and it's already running. Xbox runs a virtualization layer, a hypervisor, that layer between the hardware and the virtual components. And that's one reason why Xbox, how often does, does your Xbox crash as often as your PC or laptop? No. No. Yeah. Nope, it doesn't. That's because that's turned on. Uh, a lot of times you can go into the BIOS uh, there's a setup screen on your laptop or PC. A lot of times it's there and you just have to turn on the VT or you have to turn on the AMD V in order for it to work. And if it's not turned on, then you try to run a virtual machine and it doesn't work. Okay. So that's something that you have to watch out for when you're setting up. For the installation process, this book and the author does not tell you it's important to prepare your own personal technology, to optimize your personal technology. I did. That's going to be in the study guide, and I'm going to expect you to know that for your first assessment for module one. So the steps that you took for assignment 1.1 to show me what you have for your capacity, that's not going to be the same as the uh, assignment that's coming up. Let's take a look at this real quick. Uh, do we have assignment 1.2? Yeah. Optimizing your personal technology, right? You're doing disk cleanup. You're doing disk optimization. After you finish updating everything, you adjust performance for visual effects on there, and then you customize. Um, does anyone need, does anyone need a video of how to do all that. Or, or did this make sense? Did everybody see this in the resources folder, optimizing your personal tech? Yes, I yes, did. Sir. Okay. And everybody was able to do that? Except for the virtual Martian, Martian setup. The last part. The last, yeah, the one with the one, the fourth. Um, let's let's find out where it is here. Let's remove everything. This I'm gonna say. I if it doesn't a little time. Do you have whether you hold up? Reset. Don't get me started on appliances. This one. Okay. Just saying. Did everybody do the fixed virtual memory? Yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm talking about. After you do the disk cleanup and defrag, after you've loaded all that stuff, if you go into this PC, and you go into change settings, go into advanced and performance, and advanced again. So everybody see how I have initial size and maximum size set? I have 12 gigs of RAM. So I'm going to use as much virtual memory for the initial size and the maximum size. I'm going to click set and then OK and then apply. And mine's grayed out because I've already done it. If you have enough hard disk space, you can go much more than that. I don't have a lot of hard disk space. I didn't want to use more than 12 gigs of hard disk space, but if you have hundreds of gigs of free hard disk space, you can go two or three times as much as your RAM. So if you have eight gigs of RAM or 16 gigs of RAM, you can take your calculator and you can say, okay, 
I have lots of disk space. I've done all the optimization up to this point, but I'm going to, I'm going to make it really high performance. So I'm going to take the amount of RAM that I have, eight gigs times 1024. And I'm going to do three times that amount times three. I'm going to put the numbers in that virtual memory screen, 24,576. And what I'm saying is that's this, no, it's this screen here. I go into performance, advanced, change. I put in 25,476, 25,476. That's going to take up 24 gigs of hard disk space because I have plenty to spare. Well, I, I didn't. I, I said, okay, I've only got a certain solid state hard drive that only has 240 gigs, roughly, almost 240 gigs. So I don't want to take up 24 or 36 or 48 gigabytes of disk space for virtual swap memory. But that's, that's one of the preparations that helps virtual machines run very fast. Any, anything, it helps anything run very fast. So that's the part that uh, it was last piece. It was one of the things that you were supposed to do for your uh, assignment, right? Uh, did anybody need any help going through that piece of it, the, the optimization part? No. I, okay. All right. So I'm going to put an assignment out where you install the virtual box. And now that you've prepared your system, once you accept the, um, when you go to install it, there's a couple of things you need to know about. Uh, it's going to disrupt your network for just a moment, but usually that goes away after just a moment. It's gonna create some stuff and there's this option to install what's called the, so yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna work about the network disruption. And there's this thing called the extension pack. You wanna load the extension pack because it's gonna allow your, your, your physical hardware to work more efficiently with the virtual hardware. If you have a USB port that's 3.0, it's 10 times faster than a USB 2.0 port. Your virtual machines are going to have 10 times faster USB transfers if you plug in a thumb drive or an external disk. Um, if you have a better graphics card, the extension pack will help you use better graphics. You'll have better resolution and display results for your virtual machine. Uh, this walks you through it. So if you purchase the textbook for $9, it shows you everything you need to do to set it up. That's part of what you're going to do for your first solution. One of the most important things you have to do is make sure that when you install VirtualBox, once it's set up, before you create the first virtual machine, you're going to want to change a setting. And I wanted to share this with you right now so you could see, and then we're done for the day, okay? So if I go into VirtualBox, under file, there are preferences. By the way, in chapter three, it talks about all of the features and functionalities inside this interface. It's called the VirtualBox Manager. So when VirtualBox is running, it has three different uh, main components of the main screen. You have a preview screen here. This one shows you what's going on for setup in each of the virtual systems. And this is a listing of your virtual, it's called the virtual machine inventory. I only have one virtual machine loaded. We're going to have several virtual machines loaded. You're going to go to preferences and you want to change where it stores the machines. When you create a virtual machine, it's going to put tens of gigabytes of file storage into a folder. So if you create a virtual machine with a, a, a 40 gigabyte hard drive, it's going to create a 40 gigabyte file. That's going to take a while. 
But on a regular hard disk, it's not too bad. It takes a couple of minutes. If, however, you accept the default settings, if any of you have OneDrive active, where your documents are stored in OneDrive automatically, it will store the virtual machine in the cloud across your internet. Put another way, when you try to run your virtual machine, it has to pull 40 gigabytes, not bits, gigabytes of disk from across the internet. And it has to download it and load it on your screen before the first, before the first window even loads. So if you use OneDrive to store your documents automatically as a part of Windows 10, in here, when you go to Preferences, you can change the setting so it doesn't use documents. You do not want to use documents to store your machines, your virtual machines. I created a temp folder, and then I created a VM directory inside there, and that's where I put my machines. That's on the local hard disk. It's literally a million times faster. It's a thousand times a thousand times faster to load the virtual machine. So it's really important to change that setting and preferences. Your assignment for the solution will call this out intentionally. And so will the video when I walk through it. But I wanted to show you this in person in case you had any questions. Does anyone have any questions about changing the preference for where your virtual machines are stored after VirtualBox is installed? Yeah, well, um, actually, I did, I made the, I changed up, I did this same stuff, and then it didn't work for me, so. Okay. Well, if you can stick around for a minute, we can share the screen. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>